Pastor Olu Boni, Olu Shola Monye will speak to us today. She was born in Nigeria, where she graduated and worked with the National Electric Power uh, Authority before she actually quit to support her husband. She found the very first RCCG, so the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Uganda. Um, and until today, she is still the pastor of this very church, the RCCG Dominion Sanctuary. Um, after her husband, Pastor Israel Monia, went, as she said, to join the Lord in 2006. She was later then ordained as a full pastor in 2008, and I would just name some of her last uh, achievements. She was uh, involved in uh, several water supply projects in small villages and also planted more churches in, in Uganda and uh, is still pastoring and leading uh, this branch where I had the privilege to meet her in Uganda and now we are very happy that uh, you are here today and that you speak to us of uh, the topic of gender equality or the role of women in your in the Pentecostal churches. For me, the floor is yours. Very well. We are filming uh, everything and just uh, to make sure that uh, also the people who are not able to join us uh, can watch it afterwards. But because of that, we would kindly ask you if for any reason you will have to leave this room, then please move through this door and not through this one because then you might just fall into all the cameras. So please, please don't do that. Right, so now we, we listen to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, pastors, bishops. I honor each one of you uh, in this uh, hall. I want to appreciate um, Mary Lee, uh, Mr. Philly, and um, everyone who made it possible for me to be here this evening to stand before you. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you. Uh, this evening, I've been asked to talk about gender equality uh, among the Pentecostal church. Uh, I know that our major aim of gathering together in this place is um, to talk about religion and uh, sustainable development. Okay. Um, my own understanding of um, sustainable development is a global call uh, towards end of poverty and the uh, protection of our planet and ensure that all people enjoy peace and uh, prosperity. Um, in a bid to achieve this, as somebody coming from a Pentecostal background, uh, I want to see it as our way of dealing as a Pentecostal churches in Africa. Uh, is uh, our way of handling the situation, the problems, the global problems confronting the world today at large. Um, an appeal from Pentecostal mind to set on how to achieve um, a better and more sustainable future that is progressive uh, way of meeting present needs without compromising the ability of future um, generations to use resources uh, uh, at the disposal of the future uh, generation uh, that God has put, made available unto them. Um, from the, from my, the lectures I've listened to so far, that is my brief summary of what we have been trying to talk about since we came uh, in for this meeting. Uh, I come from a Pentecostal church, which is the redeemed Christian Church of God, under the leadership of Pastor E.A. Adeboye. Uh, some of you may have heard about it. It is one of the largest and fast growing churches in Nigeria. Um, presently, we worship 
in a three kilometer by three kilometer auditorium. Um, that is just to explain how big the church is. And uh, it is a mission oriented uh, Pentecostal church and um, they believe in the ministry of women. Uh, otherwise, th there will be no reason for me to stand before you. Uh, I remember uh, before I gave my life to Christ, I was a very, very shy person. So shy that I wouldn't even have the confidence to stand before uh, a crowd like this to watch them. But uh, when I came to the Redeemed Christian Church of God, I was privileged and blessed because we have leaders men leaders who believed in us they see potential in you they help you to develop and um, in the process of time you just discover that you get to a level you never imagine you can reach in ministry um i came to redeem christian church of god in the year 1992 and um, i just came into fellowship like any other christian uh, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I'm not so, I don't have a lot of books, <laughs> but I will share a lot of, a uh, lot of my sharing is part of my experience, what I have um, gone through over the years. So please, if you, if you, if I don't uh, do, uh, present a research that you expect, please pardon me, but I will share my experience and I believe you will not be disappointed. Um, when I came in that year, uh, I came in like any other Christian. I just began to fellowship. And um, one day as we were in the fellowship, our leader, I was in the intercessory de um, department. I also uh, was involved in evangelism because the church where I fellowship believes so much in mission. And they believe in um, every member of a community should be converted and made to be a believer and a practicing Christian. So based on that, I just joined the department. And that day, our leader just came to me and told me, you lead us in prayer. I said, oh my God. And I handed over the microphone to me. I within that, I don't know how long or how short, but I felt the ground could open its mouth and just swallow me because I was unprepared. I was. Uh, I was fearful, I was shy, I didn't know, but he just left me and then I don't know how long or short the prayer was, but that was it. The next uh, Saturday, I followed the group of people going on evangelism. I preached, so he told me, oh, you, you are sitting on grace. You have this much, you can, you can reach out to people and you just keep quiet all this way. From that moment, every Saturday we are, they are going out, they make sure I go with them. And um, five years down the road, uh, my husband was sent to join the mission trip to Kenya, and uh, he followed them. About nine months later, I had to resign from where I work, <coughs> and I joined him in Uganda, where we began the first parish of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. So in Redeemed, we are pioneer missionary to Uganda. I've lived in Uganda over the years and it has become my, my nation, it has become my community, the people have become my people. Um, this, what I want to share this evening uh, is more of an appeal to especially our leader, our Pentecostal bishops, leaders and, and pastors in this place who, who have influence over women and especially the uh, vulnerable group who, who don't have a voice to speak for themselves. I want to please appeal and plead that we should do everything within our capacity to empower women um, under our leadership. God has given us the destiny of these people these people to handle and we must do it like somebody who will account for everything we the way we handle them and how far we are able to take them in life and the fulfillment of God assignment upon their life um, uh, the church battered uh, at Pentecost is not uh, just uh, a building or a structural 
uh, engineering, I mean, engineer constructed the structure. It's, it's, it's more of an assembly of people, a people called out, specially selected people, that will be a voice that will represent Jesus Christ. And that's why, even though there were existing churches around him that time, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what kind of church is Jesus Christ referring to? A church that will stand out, a church that will be a voice, a church that will be an ambassador, irrespective of gender, whether male, female, a people called out who are doggedly determined to represent Christ and be a voice in their community. That's the kind of church Jesus Christ um, was looking at. And he said, I will build them. I will empower them, whatever it takes. Unfortunately, today, the church battered uh, at Pentecost have lost the focus. Uh, they've lost the focus. They've lost the essence of where they were called. And many times where we are supposed to be a voice, we are no, not standing as a voice. We are we supposed to fight against certain uh, ill in our society. We, we don't seem to be concerned so much. And when we are talking of a poverty eradication and a development that is sustainable, uh, we need the Christian voice. We need the voice of the church. The voice that is not structural, but the church that is a people. Praise. Oh, sorry. Don't. <laughs> I want to say praise the Lord. I'm used to that. <laughs> It is worthy of note um, that um, the purpose of the church is to reconcile the world back to the creator through her lifestyle and kingdom values. And what are the kingdom values? Uh, Jesus Christ said, I was visited when I was in prison. Uh, I was naked, but they clothed me. And at the end of that discussion, he said, whoever does any of this thing to any of this little one, young one, in my name, they have done it unto the Lord. They have done it unto their creator. And um, sadly, the church has joined in pursuit of shadows instead of centering on the will of God. If you look at the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 21, um, time may not be able, may not permit me to read into some of the scripture, but please help me to note it. That this has delayed the coming of the Lord. The, 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 the coming of Jesus Christ is imminent. Though in some quarters today, people are no longer talking about heaven, they are no longer talking about hell. But the truth is, this is real. And whether we we do what is expected of us or not, it can only delay the coming, but Jesus Christ I mean coming is imminent. He, he, he will come. So because we believers who are supposed to be the church, who are supposed to be God's ambassador, Christ's ambassador, who are supposed to stand to cry against the ills in our society, we are not moving. Or those of us who are moving, we are moving at a very slow speed. We are not doing it as people with passion. We are not doing it with the whole of energy we have within us. And so I believe it is one of the things that is delaying um, the coming of the Lord. Because Jesus Christ said, I'm coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. Until we make the world around us. People begin to see the glory. We begin to reflect the glory of the Lord. And people see the glory of the Lord through our lifestyle. And the kingdom, the, 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 the gospel is preached to everywhere. So the voice that was heard on the day of Pentecost when several nations were represented in a hall, just like we gather like this, but the Bible said they spoke in different, different languages, but they were able to hear one another. The language we are speaking today is that poverty should be eradicated, is that there should be sustainable development. I want to imagine uh, a situation 
where every every believer, every church rise up, every church leader rise up and become advocates and become a voice to the voiceless women because most of the time the people that are marginalized are women the people that are discriminated against are women the people that people don't believe anything good can come out of them are women even in the time of Jesus Christ, the same thing happened um, from the society he was in. But he stood out and decided as a man to believe in women. No wonder um, every woman that come in contact, I mean that came in contact with him, their life never remained the same. He made sure he transformed them and placed them on a path where they could fulfill their destiny. Uh, each time I remember the story of that woman caught in adultery and they say he was caught in the very act. Every time my brain keeps asking me, who was he committing adultery with? They would have killed her that day. They were about to stone her and they say she was caught in the very act and I keep asking with who? That is the kind of society that Jesus Christ operated, but he looked away from the usual practice of the men of the society of his day. He saw that woman in a different light. He intervened in her case, and thank God her life was spared. Another woman I saw was the one the Bible says was an adulteress. He, she had committed adultery to the point that she couldn't even count the number of, of men she had changed. If it were today, many people wouldn't want their husband to sit near this woman because she was a threat. But Jesus Christ saw her in a different light. She, he was able to engage with her and her life became radically transformed from that moment she became one of the powerful evangelists of her day because there was a leader who dear believed in a woman irrespective of her gender today I'm appealing to leaders here I'm appealing to each and every one of us that's we will not allow all the teachings, all the presentations that we've had in this place to just go down the drain. We will go and become a voice. You all know that women are is an instrument of multiplication. There is nothing you invest in the life of a woman that can be wasted, if not because of the ability of a, of a woman to multiply whatever she is given. Probably you will not be seated here. The day uh, our mothers conceived us, probably several cells was uh, released that day, but she was able to preserve the one that gave back to each one of us. She was able to nurture in her womb until the point of delivery. And she produced, she nurtured, Every one of us, if I give you, if I ask a question, who would you prefer if you have the opportunity to be around you? I'm sure more than half of us would prefer to be with our mother. Um, about two years ago, I was just having devotion with my children and I asked them because in 2006, their father died. And uh, we love daddy so much in the house, we would have, we would trade anything to make sure we have him around us because he was such a super dad. We were blessed to have him as a loving and caring father. But um, as the children, we've grown over the years and I was asking them, if for instance, you have to choose who should have died at the time. And my boy told me, no mommy, we love daddy, but there are some nonsense you will take from us. If it were daddy, it would have probably taken another woman and we would have become bad 
children. Maybe you would have been chased out of the house after the second woman comes in, and no matter how good, so it was good. Didn't know we love to have daddy around, but, and uh, the same thing happened to me. I, I would tr trade anything to have my mother around. She, a mother is very understanding. A woman is very, very patient. A woman is a multitasking, uh, maybe machine in quotes. She can do several jobs at the same time without you feeling the stress on her face. And she will still put up a smile. Um, I've worked in East Africa for over a decade now. I have seen pastors' wives, bishops' wives. I have seen them work and I wish if I have that opportunity. There are a lot of machines I would have loved to manufacture to make the work of the pastor's wife in Uganda an easy one. A, a pastor's wife will host visitors more than 100. She will teach on the pulpit. She has children at home to take care of. She will make sure all the visitors eat and they are comfortable and everyone is just comfortable and while the whole program is going on you will not see it on her face um that's why we need to empower women when we invest in them by the time they go they multiply you know the investment back to you uh, men will be happy that whatever they put in them was um, reproduced and uh, made gain out of it for them um Many people believe in industrialization. We believe in the big, big business. But I imagine if a woman is empowered, <coughs> he knows how to do business. For six months, I may not be able to go to the market to buy clothes, but I eat daily. A woman, I, I've worked with rural women for a very long time. Some of them have, um, big chunk of land they want to cultivate, they don't know how to go about some of these things. They are eager, they want to work, some of them want to trade, some of them you just need to empower them to know how to sow. You know like the Dockers in the Bible, the, people, the Bible said people were crying over Dockers called Tabitha. Not because uh, she died, but because of the impact she made in their life. And it was like, if this woman should go, who oh, will make new dresses for us? Who oh, will listen to us? Who oh, will help us to, in our knitting business? Who oh, will teach us how to utilize the little, little plots of land we have to make several, several things and make profit out of it? Who oh, will help us? Who oh, will teach us? and empower us so that we can be empowered and sustain without being a body, without being liability. That was the cry. Because Tabisa was a woman, I believe her husband believed in her, I believe her father believed in her, and in turn she was able to empower the life of women in her community. Another woman in the Bible is um, Deborah. Deborah was a, was a judge in her time, I believe her husband believed in her, otherwise she wouldn't have been able to play the role of a judge, of a mother, and uh, uh, a leader in her nation. Because she was empowered to do that, somebody gave her the opportunity to stand as a voice. And so, many times when women can do what men can do, let's not see it as a threat. In the redeemed Christian Church of God, my general overseer ordained average of 5,000 pastors every August on the average. We have um, representation of the mission in over 190 nations of the, uh, of the world today. Africa, outside of Africa. He is a man who believes in, men, in women very many women have been empowered through the church. There have uh, been developmental schools from the nursery kindergarten 
primary, secondary, and even university, plus several other vocation, uh, vocational institutions across the country of Nigeria, talk less of other nations. I work as um, a missionary. I've been in Uganda. By the grace of God, we've uh, acquired land for uh, where we will put Bible colleges. We don't uh, discriminate against any gender, whether men, women, we give them, I mean, they are given equal ability to maximize the potential that God has put in them. And so I want to appeal, because if we are going to move forward, if we are going to eradicate poverty, we need to teach people. Uh, poverty sometimes is not lack of money, even lack of knowledge, lack of information, lack of training, lack of exposure can be a form of poverty. And so when women are, are trained, when they are, when they are uh, empowered to have vocation, uh, skill, they are trained to have skills, they can use it in turn, not only to enhance their financial uh, status, they'll be able to help people around them, they'll be able to help their children. You can imagine in a household when you have a woman who is a complete um, illiterate, who, who does not know how to read, he spend majority of the time at home with the children, and the man is busy uh, running around to look for money in a typical African uh, environment. He is the breadwinner of the house. She has to spend most part of the hours of the day with the children. If she doesn't know how to help the children, and uh, these are the people who are going to be destiny molders of our children. Don't you think that uh, there's a question mark? Uh, I don't know how it is in the Western, but um, in, I'm talking of a, a typical African environment. Um, Nigeria, where I come from, a lot of improvements have been made. Uh, Uganda, we are trying to see what uh, we can do. Apart from Bible colleges, apart from primary, we trust by the grace of God, we will be going to secondary, and as God enables us, maybe university level. We have quite a good number of schools in Uganda, and I thank God for the work of not only the Pentecostal, even the Catholic, the, the Church of England, which is called Church of Uganda, the Protestant churches, and several others. They are doing great work. There is a lot of activity on girl empowerment, but even that one is not yet enough. We need to cut across uh, beyond Kampala, beyond the city centers, let's go into the interior. Uh, many people feel comfortable to work in the cities, but I have worked among uh, the villagers over the years and I love it. You know, there is nothing as good as at the end of, you know, some months of activity, years of activity, you see people whom you met who are like on zero level, two, three, four years down the road, you see them and you are just happy and grateful to God for the privilege uh, he has given you to work with such people. I've uh, given example of Dockers, I've given example of um, Deborah, and uh, I've um, encouraged us that the church that Jesus Christ expects is a church that cuts across denomination. It's, a, it's, it's not a structure, it is a people. It is a voice, it is a, 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 representation, I mean, a representative of Christ everywhere they are. And we don't have to be pastors to be this voice I'm talking about. My general overseer used to teach us that um, even if you're a lawyer, in your respective field, you are still an ambassador. If you are in the market, you can still be a voice in that place. The important thing is to live an exemplary Christian life. Uh, and that one now uh, demands that we move out of ourselves. Majority of um, leaders today, Christian leaders, African leaders, even in our government, the biggest challenge we have is the problem of I, me, and myself. If selfishness, self-centeredness can be removed out of our system and we can serve God 
and we do whatever we do as unto the Lord. I think we will be healed of this desire, I wish I called the spirit of a pig, we want to acquire, 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 and save for tomorrow, and save for even thousand years to come, when he doesn't even know whether that thousand year Jesus Christ would have come before then. It is selfishness. If we can think out of that selfish box and begin to do things as unto the Lord, whatever we invest in people's life, we know we have done it unto God and God is a rewarder. The Bible says he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek and serve him. Um, I'm talking about a Pentecostal approach and I'm talking about... Um, the need for people to, for men to empower women, the need for us to encourage them and empower them on small, small scale businesses, the need for us to identify their giftings. Each woman has a unique gifting in her. If only we can help her to identify and bring it out and um, help them. Many women believe that uh, they, 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 they don't have what it takes. At such a time, they need to be encouraged. And when you encourage, you do that, it becomes a powerful um, uh, instrument. Uh, most people in the African uh, environment, especially in Uganda where I live, we are mostly um, peasant farmers. The land in Uganda is so fertile. I think it is second to none around the places I've been in Africa. Uganda is a place that when you clean your tomato and you throw the water, come back in about three, four days, you will see um, tomato, or whether it is beans already germinating. That is how fertile the ground can be. And I'm not lying. That is just the truth. I imagine if women can be gathered in group, <coughs> trying to do organic uh, farming, we don't need fertilizer. If there is any need for such a land to be uh, enhanced, there are a lot of um, natural manure that can be used, and I believe there can be a group creating market for such people. Because one of the challenges we have also with the, with the farmers in an African uh, setting is that they work. They work for a period of three, four, or six months to bring out their harvest and at the end of the day, they get a peanut for it. I pity farmers. When it is time for uh, maize in season, come and see how maize can be wasted. If it is time for fruits, like mangoes and so many things, I mean so many other like that, you see how they can be wasted because that is the season. I want to imagine if we can have African leaders, I mean pastors, Pentecostal leaders who can go into food technology. You don't need to do it yourself. It's just a matter of using the influence that we have. We have several people, gifted, talented, educated people. People who are resourceful. Just share the idea. We need to help this group of people. And then uh, at the end of the harvest, we harness whatever and create a common market. There is a, a lady uh, in our church she worked with a group of ladies also who came from the Netherlands. I'm just using this as an example. Um, they gather a group of women. Some of them are single mothers, some are widows. And uh, they, they call them for Africa, helping African women to help themselves. As much as, as I believe in empowerment, I don't believe in people becoming liability on others. You help them for a while, and at the end of the day, they are able to stand to help themselves. That is what is called sustainability. They keep on reproducing. They are empowered to have sewing machine. They sew for themselves. They make dolls for themselves. They sew bags. They make shoes. They do a lot of um, bracelets. And there is a common market created for them. Some more people that have um, 
the connection, they come gather these things together, help them to do marketing, and at the end of the day, see that each of these women is adequately paid so that they are able to send their children back to school. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And until the church rise to begin to fulfill this um, role, to carry out this responsibility, that is when people around us can um, know that of a truth, the gospel becomes sweeter in our mouths. And uh, finally, as I wind up, I want us to look at um, the church battle at Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2. When you, this time around, please you pardon me to read uh, that scripture, um, Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Our speaker made us to understand in the morning that the kind of tongue, the presentation of the Holy Spirit today is not the one that, come as a, that came as a cloven tongues of fire, but the one that expects us to pay attention through listening. We want to make use of our ear, we want to speak to us. The Spirit came on Pentecost and battled that empower, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has not yet separated himself from the, the work of the ministry today. It's just that we became too busy and we can't listen to him. He wants to give us ideas. He wants to help us to strategize. He wants us to move out of the old way of doing things and show us new ideas where we can present this gospel. If you look at that church in the book of Acts, um, chapter 2, they kept on like that and the Bible talks about uh, the community of believers. They stayed together. They became God-fearing. They had fellowship and they shared so many things in common. If you look at um, verse 40 of that same scripture, there was something very unique that the early church were doing, that the church of today have become so busy, so preoccupied that they no longer have time to sit together. And so no wonder the activity of the Holy Spirit is as if is being incapacitated and it's as if he cannot do what he did those days. In verse 40, the Bible says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. The church of today in Africa, the leaders, you use their influence to save themselves from the corrupt generation around them and also become uh, agents of anti-corruption, agents fighting greed and selfishness, seriously. Uh, the Bible said those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They didn't need to preach too much because people saw what they really wanted happening among the early church because there was show of love. There is no way you can become a voice to somebody when you don't feel them. He who feels it, knows it. You must feel them. You must put yourself in their position so that when you are, you, when you are fighting, you are fighting um, to achieve something. Praise the name of the Lord. So, don't mind me, I've told you. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to their apostles teaching and to fellowship. I want to uh, believe that the voice, one voice that we have been hearing since the time we came into this place, directly or indirectly, is eradication of poverty. Development that is sustainable. How can we make use of what God has made available in our environment? without depleting the quality of the ground that God has given to us. 
that's what we are being we are being taught we are being told from different different speakers i appreciate the effort they have put in digging for information by the time we move out of this place it is my prayer that our life will not remain the same um i i was reading through um um, poverty eradication before I came here because I was discussing with some somebody and this person told me that the person that first advocates for eradication of poverty is a German I don't know how far it is true whether I stand to be corrected and he called his name Father Joseph and that this thing happened around 1987 and I say, wow 1987 and we are still moving with this kind of slow speed. We talk about poverty eradication, but what are we doing to make sure poverty is out of our midst? The fences we built around home. Thank God for Europe, thank God for America. I've been privileged to travel to America. I just, you move from the main road, you go into your house, but in Africa it is not like that. You see high walls with dogs, with security personnel, and gone. Those walls will not need to be built if only we can work towards poverty eradication and we balance, you know, the scale. The church in the book of Acts, the Bible says, people went as far as to selling their property to make sure nobody was extremely rich and some extremely poor. Those who were rich came down and they pulled down those that were down to balance the, the scale. So why would somebody come with gun at night to come and shoot somebody who have, uh, there's nothing to, to, to steal. I was privileged to travel sometimes and I, as I was passing, I saw a man Passing and they say because he was in the line of senior citizen. And I realized this is one of the ex president I said, My God, I can see an ex president of this big nation like this. No escorts, just in the supermarket, the way everybody walked in, and he was just busy doing his stuff. And they, and they told me, No, what, what, what for? I said, In Africa. <laughs> <laughs> If a fly move around, it will be shut down. <laughs> the high walls, you know, the security device, it is it would not be necessary if we live simple, selfless life. I know we talk so much about politicians, but even the Christian leaders among us, how far have we gone? If resources are put in our hands to ease the pain of people around us, how effective will we utilize? The church battered at Pentecost. If we can go back, if we can practice that love that is selfless, our service to God and make it selfless. When people come to the church and we make them feel love, there is nobody that does not thrive in an atmosphere of love. Everybody wants to be loved. If they are genuinely loved and they know that whatever you are doing, you are not doing it because there is something you want to get out of them. That's why the, the church in the book of Acts I wonder whether they even used microphone that day, but the Bible said 3,000 people on a single day, not even on a crusade, was added unto them. And the Bible said also they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. What is the apostle teaching of our days? What have we been talking about? Let's do everything within our capacity to eradicate poverty. Let's do everything we can to live selfless life. Let's do everything we can to ease the pain and bring comfort. Those ones who don't have a voice, who cannot speak for themselves, let's become their voice. 
and we will reflect the glory of God. And that is the kind of church that Jesus Christ is coming for. A church without spots, a church without wrinkle, a church that believes and practices holiness and righteousness. And the Bible says without it, no man shall see the Lord. Uh, from here, I think I will need to pause so that I can give opportunity for maybe questions or contributions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, really inspiring lecture, or shall we, shall we say, service, maybe. <laughs> we have now time um, for, as you already said, questions or reflections. Oh, there is already oh, one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay. Um, your hand was first, and then I've seen the other two hands. Three heads, yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I'm particularly impressed with the fact that in your church there's space for women. I want you to help me understand um, if you look at what is happening with women in the church at the moment, what more do you think needs to be done to make women relevant in your church? Just, just to give me. Should we collect or should we Yes, collect I'm trying to, yes, listen. Okay, but there was, and then we, yeah. I think so. Okay, yes, please, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much uh, on this lecture. Um, I very much appreciated, of course, uh, your talk on the role of women, um, especially in the first part. And um, I'm myself um, more inspired by a wave of feminism, I would say, that tries to overcome gender at the moment. Um, so yeah, maybe the, yeah, you have also thought about this concept. And I was wondering, because you were putting a lot of emphasis on how strong women can be and how as women they're so special and they're so important in our congregations. But when I think it from this like feminist perspective um, that I'm usually taking, like how to overcome the issue of gender, how to really like stand up for equality uh, between all genders by not putting an emphasis so much on gender. Um, what would you say to this approach and would it in your context at all make sense or yeah, how would you see that? Maybe let me answer yes. this too. Maybe and then this two and then we can collect yes. other twos or threes. Yes, yes. please. Um, my brother asked um, uh, the situation of women today in our church um, like I said, I come from the redeemed Christian Church of God. I think um, not to, uh, redeemed, they believe in women. It is the gifts. Uh, the Bible says man's gifts make room for him. Not only what she gives out, but the quality, the gifting, the uniqueness of God's gifting in your life is what will distinguish you. Nobody can cover your glory. That one is sure. If you have your unique gifting, if you put it to use, never allow anybody to downtrodden in you as a woman. Because you are unique. Your gifting is a unique one. Even if you are a set of twins, your twin sister will never play the role that you will play. Because God has given you that gift. Make sure you utilize it. At one point or the other, people will try to put you down, refuse to be put down. Not in a very violent way. Um, I told you that uh, we came to um, Uganda and we were pioneer missionary until 2006 when my husband passed on. Um, at first, 
very many elderly ladies, when they look at me, some of them will look at me and they will, they, they will cry. Because uh, when I'm overwhelmed, I just smile. And people wonder, what kind of person are you? You are supposed to be screaming and crying, but I will just smile. Of course, it, it took toll on me long after the incident. But at that time, I will wonder, will you, I, I, I went to one lady, I said, no, Mama, please, because she was more elderly, please don't cry. If you are crying like this, what do you expect me to do? So, oh, I, she said something I will never forget in my life. She said, I'm not crying because your husband died. Because you, by the grace of God, you are Christian. You know she, he, he is a Christian and he has died in Christ. So that is, see, but the challenges, the, the marginalization, the discrimination, the way people will treat you from this moment, that is what I think about because I've been a widow over the years and I know how widows that time I couldn't understand. But about one, two, three years down the road, even though I took courage because the church gathered, you know, and he was, he was a, a chairman of the Pentecostal pastors born again uh, churches. Even though he was a Nigerian, but we have worked with our other men and women of God in our pastor's fraternity that they have developed that trust in us. And we had to work as their chairman for about two, two three times. And I think it was in the third time when he said, well, let me hand it over. One of the way a person is a leader, effective leader, is that you are able to raise somebody. And then, so he raised that person. But after that, I discovered that our home was a stop over for everybody, whether wherever you are coming from, we could host. After that, stopped. You even see some people, you want to greet them, it's like they don't, they've never seen you. Ah, ah. I began to go, oh. And I used to wonder, why is it that people who have been in ministry, and because of the death of a partner, you just abandon Jesus, abandon ministry all along. I discover it's not that they don't want to serve. It is because of the intimidation, because of the challenges. But I have made up my mind. When the pastors gathered together, they said it is because of the war, because we saw you when you came here. You have been fighters. You came here with almost zero. You began, and the war can now has kept up. And now this man uh, just has disappeared. And we look at the bigness, the, the church, the church you, you've been there. The church was, I mean, the church we, is a big one. We have several parishes now. See, at this time, when is when this man, now what will become the future of this church? I look at the church members, it's like, I said, God, if only you give me the grace, I will come back. Even if I will leave Uganda, it will not be immediately. Um, and I, I came back. Oh my God, Jesus, why did you come back? Why did you come back? That intimidation will be there, but don't allow anyone to intimidate you. When God is for you, nobody can be against you. Amen. The Bible says, greater is in you. Greater is in you than he that is in the world. Than he who call you is faithful and is able to finish that assignment that he has given to you. So don't allow anybody to put you down. Make sure you are connected. That's one thing I love about the Holy Spirit. He is the one that makes this work sweet for us. The challenges are going to be there, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether your husband is there 24 seven or he's not there. We even have some husband that are absentee fathers. I'm sorry to use that word. But they are there. They are never around. But they are there maybe because of work here. Here and there. Did I, uh, you understand? So don't allow anyone to put you down. Don't allow anyone to make no sense of the giftings of God upon your life. Utilize your gifts. And that gift is what will distinguish you. You cannot put, you cannot light a candle and put it under. It will burn that thing. 
Neither can you cage an eagle. If you try to cage it, it will fly with the cage and move and swallow with it. So don't allow anyone to break you down as a woman. <laughs> Question. I think I've uh, used that one to answer almost the two. Did I answer your question? No. Uh, the question says uh, gender, feminism, gender, stand up. I mean, um, um, I just believe this one thing that there is a gift you carry in you as a woman. Never undermine the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. My general Obasa, whenever he's sending us out on mission, he normally call those core, core pastors who are going to be ambassadors over the nations. He will tell you, don't preach legalism. Don't preach religion. Don't talk about do's and don'ts. Anywhere you go, preach the gospel. Make sure you do discipleship, what we call discipleship. There are different, different types of training in our church. The moment you come and you give your life to Christ, people will begin to train you. Then teach the person how to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and ensure he has a Bible and they leave that person. Don't preach uh, do's and don'ts. Don't preach religion. Don't say this is this. this. You leave that person in the hands of the Holy Spirit and make sure and pray that he reads the Bible daily. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit will finish. And then we take the next two, Ananya and uh, Andreas. But first, Philip was first, I think, or, yeah, is that the case? Thank you very much for your talk, which is getting more and more inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> I, would like to, I would like to ask a question. You mentioned uh, the leadership of your church, RCCG, uh, as being very much empowering women. Um, I would like to maybe challenge that a little bit yeah. and ask, uh, well, if we look at the leadership at the uh, assistant general overseers and the general overseer itself, there's all males there. Mm -hmm. So, so why, uh, why, why does, uh, how, how do you reconcile both events? <laughs> and I would be interested, perhaps, do you think the next general overseer, I mean, uh, hopefully he will stay there for a long time, <laughs> do you think the next general overseer might uh, might be a woman. Yes. And allow me a second question while I'm standing. Um, you also made the case for economic equality in, in what you said. Um, but uh, and, and without uh, any, any judgment, what you hear very often is that uh, there's lots of exuberance in, in some church leaders. And one example that is always mentioned is um, is Adeboye, is the general overseer of RCCG with his multiple uh, airplanes and so forth. <laughs> so, uh, also, my question would be, um, yeah, well, what, is your, what is your take or what, what is your... Thank you very much. You know, sometimes uh, information is very, very important. When it's good for people, some of the people that talk, they talk out of, uh, they are not informed, I would say. Like uh, the way in the redeemed Christian Church of God, uh, automatically when you are appointed as an AGO, your wife is an AGO in charge of the women group. If you are a pastor over a parish of the redeemed Christian Church of God, you are the pastor, the woman is the mother in that church because all the, the women ministry rests on her shoulder. She may not be, of course, she doesn't have to rub shoulder with her husband because no matter what it is, husband is still the head of the woman. I hope you know that. So that respect is still there, but the duty of empowering the women 
carrying the women and the children's ministry rests on the shoulder of the woman. So if your husband is appointed as the assistant general overseer in charge of personnel, automatically and you are the woman AGO. <coughs> That's how they are empowered. You work in that capacity. Uh, and then two, the issue of um, economic um, um, for a very long time. You know, the, the Redeemed Christian Church of God believe in this uh, whatever the right hand does, don't let the hand, the left hand knows. There were a lot of projects that were going on because they were not blowing their trumpets about it. We, even those of us who are in the system, we didn't know it for a very long time. Something happened about, um, that's about six, seven years ago. I went for our annual convention. Those of us who know the Redeemed Christian Church God, there is this annual convention we do in the month of August. And so, that day, uh, they said that uh, widows, uh, there is teaching they do for widows, widowers. So I decided, I said, at least for once, let me go to study with these people and see what they teach. So as we got there, they gave us numbers. They just, they are written, you just pick a number, and at the end of the day, they will ask you, if you have picked a number, after the teachings, the discussion, you discuss, because in that, in, in the church, people meet as professionals. In my local church where I came into Uganda, lawyers meet as lawyers, lecturers meet as lecturers, um, teachers meet as and uh, nurses meet as nurses. That is how you are able to reach out to people in your profession. It is easier for a lawyer to talk convincingly and evangelize a lawyer than somebody like me. Because they know the language they will use and they, they talk in a, a different level. A medical doctor we approach, he knows how to get to a doctor more than somebody who is just a, a teacher because they, 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 they operate at different uh, frequency. So that's how it was. So that time we met as widows. And at the end of the day, they were just asking me, which, which is your number? If your number is this, move to this level. If your number is this, move to this level. And then I was wondering, what is this number? Say, um, when, uh, are you a widow? Because people don't believe in my look and my age. Many times people don't believe. They said, you mean you are a widow? Or you, are you married? I said, yes. Um, <laughs> so they told me this thing has been going on for a while, for a very long time. Don't you come for con? I say I do. But that day, for the first time, I've spent um, <coughs> uh, this year, I made about three years in the church. About seven years ago was when I discovered that the, the, the general overseer and his wife have a ministry towards widows that were over 25,000 people they take care of. The woman tell me because at the end of the day, and as, I, as they were asking me a lot of questions, I was asking God, am I in the right uh, environment? Somebody, I mean, I had that voice, coming to gain knowledge is okay, but this card in your hand, you have to give it to somebody else because somebody else needs it better than you. Mm -hmm. I don't live in Nigeria. When I got there, not of curiosity, I saw bags of rice, um, Jerry cans of cooking oil, sugar, and all manner of, you know, what you call essential commodity. The woman told me they do that when that, that by the time you take that home, is able to sustain you until around December, January. And then by the time you come for the special Holy Ghost uh, program, they will load you with something that, like that and they give you an envelope. Over 25,000 people that day. And I was amazed. Each one went with all that with an envelope in their hand. And the envelope is in case you want to buy clothes for your children, yourself, you need to buy change some, that money is for you. Then I also realized that as a widow, there are times, because at a point, my children, they all grew together and they entered university almost around the same time. Handing three university children wasn't easy. And this time I wanted to send them to school, I was having challenge, and I was privileged to see uh, the wife of the general overseer. 
when I express, he just told me, um, I'm so busy now, but I'll make sure I get to you. Immediately after that program, they traveled to UK, but I was so amazed. One morning, about three days, I just had a phone call. And when she talks, I know this is money. I said, okay, where are you? I'm in UK. Immediately after the program, I traveled to London, but concerning the issue we discussed. And there and then made the arrangement. The person they sent to me gave me the money that cleared the school fees of the children. And they have several thousands. They do that. That is a regular, regular. Because they don't put it in CNN. They will not put it in BBC. Nobody will know that. And uh, when this issue of death, the general, uh, the redeemed Christian Church of God have only one jet. <laughs> it's not even a plane, so to say. And uh, I, as I drop into this one time, there was a, uh, is it, is this um, TV, of, um, TV station in Kenya that also put and they were, they were interviewing and talking so much about it. And with the way Pastor Adeboye preaches, I begin to, as this man become worldly, I began to also probe into it. What, what, if, what brought about this issue of jet? Is it because of, I realized that the person that began to advocate for the purchase of jets for the general of Asia wasn't even in Nigeria. Yes. He wasn't a Nigerian. He went for a program because when he goes, he goes with a team of ministers. And when you calculate their <coughs> airfare expenses over, he travels, he has a churches in almost, in over 190 nations. And he travels at least, there are places he visits maybe once in a year. And by the time you calculate that expense, the airfare for maybe about 10, 15, 20 people over a period of time, my time is four, five, ten years. And that was how that man of God saw and advocates, I think more than half of the money that was used to buy that jet came from that place. Because I probed into it, I got to, so sometimes people don't, it's good to talk from an informed point when you know actually. Uh, a lot of people, God has prospered them. God has moved them from where they were, but uh, unfortunately for men of God, they, there's a way people see them. I also, even the little me, I see it. There's a way people expect widow to, to move, to walk, to appear. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, when you are a widow, there's a way you are expected <coughs> to look, there's a way you are expected to, to walk, there is a way when you, they see you, we know who's supposed to appear written all over you. Uh, yeah, but when it is not like that, people begin to question. So it is like that. If you are too poor, people will talk. If you are rich, people will talk. The man said, I've tasted poverty. And by the grace of God, they came out of it. Poverty is not a good thing. Yes. Yeah. It didn't begin like that. God has used him to. I think men of God here, you can be a main witness. When you pray, you have helped somebody, he comes, he says, man of God, I don't want to see your children sit down because of school fees. I'm, I'm not, I want to take charge of paying your children. So please, can you give me the detail? Has it happened? Yeah, it happens. <laughs> it happens. And that's how it's supposed to be. When you bless other people, God will cause men to bless you. For whatever you make happen for others, the Holy Spirit will make it happen to you. Did I answer the question? Yes. Amen. I see a hand over there. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are more questions now. I have uh, yeah. Reverend Marita, Anandi, Andreas, and Tamara, but maybe if we go for. I Okay. Then yeah, thank you, thank you for all this. Yeah, no, 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 no,
いやジャッジすぐ言うのは上手で,でいつもはジャッジすジャッジだけわかってますでスモークラス Those who qualify will be vetted and then people will ask you to select them and women are majority you find that they elect men those positions What is, what, is, what, what is the problem? And what do you think uh, your church did with others that they did not know? Because, uh, like in Kenya, many churches, my church of course, are so that they, uh, you know, um, we do, you know, freedom. Uh, we have even women bishops. But, but if you look at the, the, even the system of our government, you look at the you know, our churches, women as majority, They have, they have, they have to vote for their, for their own, they don't vote for them, they vote for men. Eh? Men are leadership from top to bottom, and women are there that majority. So what is the problem? Why? Um, what I want to say, can we, can we also say, and I'm going to so let me also say this. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, Reverend, thank you very much. Um, I made so many notes. Uh, my first is a comment, and the second is a question. The first comment I have is, Have you written a book? <laughs> Have you? Because I hope you, I hope you write these things down. Um, you've got amazing things that you say, and I can resonate with most of your theology. I'll ask you some questions later with the coffee. The question I have is, um, the, you talked a lot about um, strengths and gifts, and no one must put you down if you have that. And I was just wondering, um, if you have the gift thing as you to preach and to to teach, but your husband is not necessarily the reverend of the community or the church, then you can't be, and, and I want to understand this, be the equal, uh, I don't know how to explain this, and you guys must excuse me if I'm pronouncing or, or articulating this wrong, but if I understand is he become the pastor or the reverend and you then as a woman over the women's ministries, but if your strength and your gift then is to be that, uh, can you become that without your husband having the same gift? or not? Um, yes. Thank you. Um, okay. uh, the first one is appointment of the women in the imposition, um, uh, women appointment of people into position. The truth is, if we look at the Bible very well, um, God's system is autocratic. It is not appointment of church leadership by the people for the people. Appointment that I mean, as thank God, sir, you are a bishop. You must not um, appoint people by their look. You know, even Samuel, <coughs> he was the national prophet over the people of Israel. When it came to the appointment of David, he almost missed it. He saw Is that Abinada? I'm trying to... The big brother of David. When he look at it, say, this is it. When he look at the imposing height of that man, how hefty, say this one should be able to lead the children of Israel into the battlefield. But God said, look not at the outward appearance. Mm -hmm. So if the national prophet of Israel was almost missing the will of God, who are we? That now calls for serious prayer and the need for us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Thank God he was still sensitive in spite of what he saw. When the Holy Spirit impressed upon his heart, look not at the outward appearance. This is the man. When David came in, he was able to tell him, this is the man, and point, go for and pour and anoint him. <coughs> So that is the appointment I mean. As a leader, you must be able to wait upon the Lord. Jesus Christ says, my sheep knows me, and they hear my voice. The voice of stranger will they not hear. If you take time to listen to him, he will speak to you. The people you have given responsibility in the church, how have they managed the responsibility you have given them? That moves them to the next point. There are times in our church as structured as it is. You should be able also to know 
when a pastor's wife is not called into the ministry, it doesn't mean that all pastors are automatic, their, their wives are automatically called. It that the pastor's wife is not in the spiritual um, level of the husband. Like in our ministry, we appoint women leaders in the church. And it is the responsibility of every leader, every pastor, to raise men. As you are raising men, you are raising women. I thank God for the length of time I've spent um, in Uganda. We have um, over 20, we are going to about 25 or more parishes of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. We must at no point become Alpha and Omega, where people will begin to see us as if we are God Himself. One of the responsibilities, anyway, maybe I'm talking from a missionary point of view, is that no matter how long I spend in Uganda, I should be able to hand over the baton into somebody's hand. People who will continue this work. And so I believe in the empowerment of the youth. I'm not in the church now for this whole week, but I have young men. There are times I deliberately sit down and I watch them. Sometimes, they make a mistake, you allow them to learn from the mistakes. I have raised, sometimes, I've, I've released some people that my heart, in my heart, but because of the calling of God that I have discovered in their life, I have to let them go. It is sweet to carry people around you, and the church is full, one church is full. The church is not measured by its sitting capacity, it is measured by its sending capacity. So as a church leader, we must be able to raise leaders. For no reason should we allow everybody to look on us. When the man of God is not in the house, then the other people are not men of God. Are they men of God? No. You should be able to reproduce. When you are not there, people who will. So I've sent people out. I've sent people into other parishes, they have open churches there, and my general officer keep telling us that we thank God for what God is doing in the redeemed procession of God. The truth is there is no single denomination that can do the word uh, evangelization, the work of evangelism in the world. We need one another, we need to work in unity, we need to work, you use your gifting, you reach out, this other reach out, until the glory of God is established and then Jesus Christ will come. Amen. The gospel will be preached. Hallelujah. Uh, did I answer the second one? Your... Did I answer the other question? Yes. Would you like me to rephrase it? I just, uh, I'm almost there. Uh, the question was regarding um, gifts and strengths that you said should not be put down but have the gift. Okay. And the question was then, as a woman, if you have the gift to then uh -huh. be And the husband, and your, 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 your husband is not the one in charge. Um, the truth is, as a woman, irrespective of who your husband is, God call you uniquely as an individual. We are not going to give account of our activity here on earth based on, the, on our husband's activity. Even at that level where you are, do the Bible says we should do the work of an evangelist. Do it in season and out of season. If you are a teacher, teach. But teach. But could you be the pastor or a minister? You don't all the, can you hold the position a pastor or minister or reverend without your husband having the same level. As yes. You. Yes. You. What well, you see, there is a woman I respect so much, Joyce Mayer. Joyce Mayer is a very well known woman of God. The husband is not a, a, a pastor. I, I remember one day because I if I have opportunity to listen, I, I listen to her because there's one person I would love to mentor me, either from a distance or from, you know. And she said that her husband, when she's at home, she's the wife. But when she's outside on the pulpit, that's when she's the pastor. Uh -huh. So the husband is maybe more of an administrator or just a very good brother in the church. But that is her calling. And she's doing it very well. The same thing sometimes, the husband might be the apostle, the bishop, the prophet, if you are not in whatever God, one thing I want us to know is that every woman has a gift. 
You may not be a teacher, you may be a very good intercessor. By the way, every woman is a good intercessor. Don't you think that? You don't know. Every woman is wired to talk. <laughs> yes, our system is wired to talk. So don't talk about people. Don't talk to, you know, talk to God. If we only know how to cheer that. God honors the prayer of a woman. This our need is so powerful. Without the bending of this need, life cannot come into existence. So if we know how to go on our knee, a lot of things can be achieved. Yes. So even if you are not a teacher, you might be a good intercessor. If you are not an intercessor, you might be a good praiser, a good worshiper. You know, it may not be able, you may not be good in all those things, but you may be good at visitation, follow up in the church. There are some unsung heroes in our church, in our ministry. We think it is only those people that carry microphone. No, some of us that are here, don't be surprised that the person that is making your church to thrive now is that unknown woman who just go every every week, every other week, he send messages, he visits people, he goes to pray for them. People don't see her handle microphone on the pulpit, but he's touching lives in the church, and that is what the ministry is trying. So, as a woman, make sure you occupy your role. The gifts that God has put in you, make sure you use it. And when you use it, it is that gift that we find you. That's what will distinguish you among many. No one can bury your, your light. Mm -hmm. Sir, you have a question. So you really talk to us. Yeah. 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 Do you know me? Okay. That's why I've caught this yeah. uh, message short because I know there will be time for <laughs> and then maybe we can try to answer them together and but uh, please so the first one I have on my list is Tamara please um, okay. it, covered, it was covered okay yes. wonderful yeah <laughs> make short questions or say it was already covered that is <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful then the next one is Tamara please um, I think my four remarks uh, to someone else yeah. which uh, in conversation with what Reverend said so I'll talk about the text as well so. okay that was okay that was Samuel appointing David because many women, I'm a Pentecostal woman from the United States, right? So many women feel that um, that Samuel has missed them, you see. And that's the issue. That um, because we don't look like mm -hmm, somehow there is something about the fact that we wear a skirt that is offensive. Therefore, we are overlooked. Now, whether it's that there are no more, no longer any true Samuels in the church, that's left for us to discern. Because the true Samuel will see the gift. But from my experience, the numbers don't show the evidence that the Holy Spirit is not partial to whether you wear a skirt or whether you wear pants. So we are talking from a perspective in the West, as I as a woman, um, where we're wondering why the numbers aren't showing the representation of the Holy Ghost in our context. And we're looking to you for some answers. Um, that's just the way I see uh, it. If you look at um, the way I began, uh, I mentioned that uh, the church today is not the structure. <laughs> It's not the building. It is a called out people. It is an assembly of peculiar people. It is um, a voice, a group, a voice, assembly, a representative. That's what describes the church battered at Pentecost. And Jesus Christ said, and even though there were several churches, or there were already existing synagogues, but he said, I will 
we build my church and the gates of hell, hence will not prevail against it. So this called out people, this voice, this ambassador, the very specially selected people, are not just they're a group of people. And when they begin to rise up, nobody can intimidate them. It is a matter of time. They can only be, how do I put it? They can only be delayed. Look like even in our own program, we can use the word delay, but there is nothing delay in, the, in, in God's program. <coughs> there is no delay in Him, there is no disappointment in Him. Everyone works according to their timing, and in God's own timing for that individual, things will fall into proper place and shape. You will be distinguished, but make sure you are moving. Never remain stagnant. Don't say because um, one time, um, that was the, the last time when there was Raila Odinga. Prop, you will remember. Uh, Pastor Duboye came all the way from Nigeria and said, because that is where our ministry began in East Africa. He said, there is a way my spirit is attached to this place. And the first time I came and God gave me the vision of heaven, it was in this uh, city of Nairobi. So when he had that crisis was, you know, going on, people were killing, he had to come. And when he came, sorry, I have to share this one now, but it's fine. Then he, he called all the pastors, all the workers and ministers of the church that we are going to go on a three-day fast. Because a lot of our friends were killed, a lot of our pastors were killed. It was a very devastating uh, season for us. So we enter and uh, we began praying. Day one, day two, day three. And uh, in, that, uh, in that season, he told us that you, if you really love God, you don't need a title to function effectively for him. Whether they call you bishop, they call you prophet or they don't call you. You don't need a title for you to function effectively for God and to serve Him. And so we were there, we did. On the third day, it was one of the amazing days. I saw Raila Odinga. That's where the day I was uh, ordained. The man, I made sure I stood by him and I snapped picture with him. Because his appearance in the church that day is a proof that indeed this God answers prayer. People have been killed, but on the third day, we just saw the man walked into the church and he said, uh, Pastor Adeboye, I've come to tell you that we surrender. Sir, I don't know whether you remember. Yeah. Sir, I surrender. All the fighting, all the whatever, I don't know what you did with your God, but uh, we are tired of fighting and I promise you, in the church, and he raised his hand like this. And that was the end of that crisis. Many people did not know how many people fasted, how many, whether we did PG, what, one, and several other children of God. I'm not claiming only religion. Very many people, but the truth is, God answers prayer. Now, this one brings me to remembrance. There was a question that was raised, was it in the morning or sometimes about... Uh, about a service, something like service to God. Whether people recognize you now, God says, God is a rewarder. The Bible says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek and do what? And serve. He said, I will make up my jewel and I will put a mark of distinction between them that serve me and them that serve me not. A time is coming. Nobody can sit upon your star. Nobody can sit to cover your glory. It must come out and it must reflect. 